Okay, thank you for uh, coming uh, this afternoon. Uh, I am instructed to hold up this book and implore you to buy it. Uh, <laughs> it is the last in the trilogy of the God Work, Soul Work, Life Work trilogy, and the reason I know that it's the last <laughs> is that we have milked these lectures for all they are worth, and there, there is absolutely nothing left. And so I promise you, if you will buy this one, it will be the last. Uh, okay, uh, so there, there, there you go. My, public, my publisher will be, how many copies do you have to buy? <laughs> well, you'll, you'll have to discuss that with the publisher uh, outside. Um, you're, you're probably aware that when you speak at the Pepperdine Lectures, oh, well, okay, let me get to the important stuff. Uh, I have not worn all black since September. All black is gone, and so... Um, you, you don't need to ask why. When I decide to share that, I will share it with you all, but uh, at, at the moment, I don't, uh, I don't care to. Um, <laughs> what I have discovered is I have a lot of old clothes in my closet that are just like new, uh, and, and so I've, I've started to wear them. Um, uh, you probably know that you, if you speak in the Paradigm Lectures, you actually have to uh, turn in your topics way before you're ready to speak. And so the goal is always, when you're somebody like me, is to send in a topic that is so generic that when the moment comes, you can speak on whatever's on your heart and, and mind and not be accused of being dishonest in your advertising. Okay, so um, uh, I, I sent in something like, I don't, I don't know, the, what is it, Theology for Idiots? Uh, which... Uh, I've actually read some of those, um, you know, books for, for dummies and idiots, and they're actually quite excellent books if you've read uh, any of them. And I didn't mean it uh, to be insulting, it's just I didn't know what I would want to talk about. And so that seemed generic enough to uh, cover it. Uh, also, uh, I have not lost uh, my passion uh, for believing uh, that theology should not be left to the professionals. Uh, theology belongs to the church belongs to the people of God. And uh, some of us, are it just happens, are uh, idiots. And so, um, self-included. So when I talk about theology for idiots, what I'm talking about is theology for the church, okay, uh, as, as opposed to just uh, the uh, professionals. Okay, so we're, um, uh, I, I want to say some things that I hope uh, are important. Uh, I'm I'm going to try to say them in a way that matter, and hopefully we're going to have some fun uh, along the way, uh, because after all, this is Malibu, right? Uh, that's the way it should be. All right, so we're going to start out with a little audience participation. What I'm basically going to do is an experiment. Uh, I'm experimenting uh, on you. Uh, I'm going to just ask you to talk to a person beside you, and I'll give you what I want you to talk about, and... Uh, and then we'll kind of poll the audience and see how it uh, comes out. Um, I, I want to start out with uh, the famous uh, trolley car dilemma. Now, uh, the, the, the trolley car dilemma has become so famous, there's this whole branch of ethics now that people derisively call trolleyology. And, uh, you know, the one, the one thing that you can pretty well assume with a trolley car dilemma is that it will happen, have happened to no one in your audience, uh, uh, okay, because, you know, there just aren't that many trolleys uh, left in the world, and uh, people are almost never tied to the tracks. Okay, so... Um, I am going to prove to you uh, in a moment that uh, this dilemma has very real-world implications. Uh, but first, we're going to have some fun. Uh, and after that, we'll quit having fun, I'm sure. <laughs> um, oh, it reminds me of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm missing a couple of days of class. Um, one day, actually. And uh, occasionally, my students will need to miss a day of class. And it never fails. If they're a good student, they always ask the same question. Are you going to do anything important in class? 
no, I'm just going to waste everybody's time. Uh, you know, I, uh, it's like I always do, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be the same. Okay, the basic form of the trolley car dilemma goes like this. The trolley's coming down the tracks. There are five people tied to the tracks that the, co the trolley is going to run over and kill. But you are standing by a switch. And by pulling that switch, you can divert the trolley so it will not kill those five people. But if you pull the switch and divert the trolley, there is one person tied to the track over there, and your action will lead to their sure and immediate death. Do you do nothing and allow the five people to be killed? Or do you pull the switch, forcing the trolley onto the other way, where it will kill the one person tied there? You now have about 60 seconds to talk to somebody beside you and tell them what you would do. Okay, thank you. All right, now what we're going to do... Now we are, by a show of hands, going to show how we voted. The reason I had you talk to the person beside you is to get you committed so you can't, you know, you can't kind of weasel out of it. Uh, there's one uh, famous ethicist who's, when presented with this kind of stuff, says, I don't do trolleys. Uh, okay, but every, everybody's going to do trolleys here for a minute. How many of you said, uh, I would flip the switch and, and kill the one? Okay, look around. Keep, keep your hands up for a minute so everybody can see. Okay. Those of you who said, I would do nothing and allow the five to be killed, raise your hands. Okay, all right, so most of us are going to kill this person. All right, now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I know, yeah. Somebody always says, okay, there's another way. No, my story, my rules. Uh, <laughs> a trolley dilemma number two. They are, there are actually dozens of them. There is a trolley coming down the tracks. And as it's coming down the tracks, there are these five people tied to the tracks, and the trolley is going to run over them and surely kill them all. You are standing on an overpass over the trolley tracks. And uh, you look, and standing beside you, leaning over, looking at this scene, is an extremely large man. And if you give him a gentle shove, <laughs> he will fall down on the tracks. He will certainly be killed by the trolley, but his bulk will be big enough to keep the trolley from rolling down the tracks and killing the five. <laughs> now, those of you who are thinking about being heroic, you are much too slim and trim to jump off the track and save them. The only way to save them is to push the fat man off the bridge. Now talk to the person beside you and let's see how many of you are going to push the fat man. Okay, it's, it's time to vote again. Raise your hand if you said I'd push the fat man off the bridge. Those of you who said no, not going to do that. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to vote for w one more thing in this regard of the trolley thing. Okay, now you got to watch these hands. 
How many of you said, I would pull the switch and switch the train, and then said, I would not push the fat man? Raise your hands. Okay, now look around. Okay. All right. As you can see, that is a significant group in the audience. And it is puzzling to philosophers um, that people are willing to pull the switch and not push the fat man when the outcomes look exactly the same. Uh, and in fact, in both cases, you are doing some action that is directly leading to the death of one for the preservation of the five. Uh, but despite my bantering earlier, uh, the people who raised their hands the last time are not idiots. They felt the inconsistency. And they're puzzled by it themselves. But there's something about pushing the fat man that seems fundamentally different than flipping that switch. Even if I can't for the life of me describe exactly what it is. Or as my students would put it, it's just wrong. Uh, by the way, this is the point at which I remind you that people are paying thousands and thousands of dollars of tuition at ACU for this kind of instruction. So, <laughs> I make you feel better about your uh, situation. Okay. Uh, dilemma number two. Uh, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're not doing any more trolleys. Oh, I, well, no. Okay. Uh, let me, let me remind you uh, of an old story that uh, many of you know, but some of you may not. Uh, when the Germans were uh, bombing London, uh, they uh, thought they were bombing the center of the city of London when they were actually bombing an outlying suburb. And the reason they believed that is because British intelligence was sending out messages allowing the Germans to intercept them to make them think they were bombing the center of the city. And so they took actions that almost guaranteed that some of those people out in the suburbs were going to be killed, but saved countless lives by misleading the Germans about how much damage they were actually doing. And I'm telling you, it's the trolley car dilemma it's exactly the same thing. That is, are you willing to sacrifice the, the few for the good of the, of the many? And there are actually hundreds of applications of the trolley car uh, dilemma. But I, I, don't, I don't really do trolleys, so let me move on. Uh, okay, uh, this ethics story that I'm going to give you very quickly uh, comes from uh, uh, Lawrence Kohlberg, fam famous moral philosopher. Uh, it, it, he's really responsible for kind of the theories of moral development that are still, by and large, uh, accepted as true uh, in the world. Uh, he eventually committed suicide. It's kind of a sad story. Guy spent his whole life doing moral philosophy and, uh, and then decided to kill himself, and who, who knows what kind of pain he was in. Uh, but this is probably as, as famous a, a 20th century ethical dilemma as there is, besides, besides the trolley. Uh, this is a story about Heinz. Uh, and those of you who've, who've been here before when I've done some ethics stuff, you know that there are no happy ethics stories. Okay, in every ethics story, someone is having something terrible happen to them. Uh, and Hein's wife is uh, dying of a rare form of cancer. Uh, there is a druggist in town who has created a drug that has great possibilities of being able to cure Heinz's wife. Uh, but he is an industrious uh, chemist, and uh, the drug take, costs him $200 to make, and he sells a dose of the drug for $2,000. Uh, Heinz is a man of modest means, cannot raise the $2,000, Ask the, 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 the druggist to sell it to him uh, less expensively or let him pay on credit. The pharmacist refuses to do that, says, I invented the drug, I'm going to make money uh, from it. 
Uh, and so in desperation, Hines breaks in and steals the drug for his dying wife. Uh, end of story. As you notice, uh, no trolleys were harmed uh, in this story. Uh, and of course the question is, when Hines broke in and stole the drug for his dying wife, did he act ethically or not? Uh, you have about 60 seconds to talk to the person beside you and decide on that one. Okay. Uh, I am anxious to. Uh, I'm anxious to see this vote. Everybody's committed now. How many of you said Heinz acted ethically? Those of you who say yes, he acted unethically. Okay. There's, I, there appears to be a few more who thinks he acted unethically than acted uh, ethically. Okay, so uh, now I am going to tell the Heinz story in a couple of different ways. Uh, wouldn't it be strange, formed as we are, as Christian people, drawn to love by the Creator God, who in His very nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is relational, and created us to be relational. Wouldn't it be strange if such a God who did such creative work uh, would then uh, have an ethic that was built on rules, not relationships? And how would people be bound by these these rules that do nothing but contribute to one man's greed when relationship and life is at stake. And what is love worth if you're not willing to, to sacrifice your own safety or freedom in behalf of the one you love? Now, don't those of you who said he acted unethically <laughs> feel small right now? <laughs> I'm now going to tell the story another way. I want to tell you the story about a world that decides that anything I want or desire, I have a right to. And if I need or I want something, I can break any rule or any commandment to get it. And in fact, the Creator God who makes covenants feels so strongly about placing a hedge against our human beings' covetousness. Uh, by the way, the Ten Commandments, that's by far the most interesting one. Uh, it's the only one that's directly about attitude. All the rest of them are about actions. That one's about attitude. And, and, and so he places these hedges. He says, human beings desperately need rules or commands. Otherwise, we just make a muck of our world. That, by the way, is not an opinion. That's an empirical observation. <laughs> and, and so there are times when a rule or a command interferes with my personal happiness. But God knows, in the end, it's for our good. Now, don't those of you who were so selfish as to steal that drug feel small? <laughs> um, okay, now the question is, is there a point uh, anywhere uh, in our future? <laughs> <laughs> On the first day of my theology class, uh, the following is the primary thing I try to teach. 
Uh, when you're talking about any theological system, uh, the question you ask is not, is it true? Uh, because the answer to that is always the same. Yes and no. <laughs> because theological systems that attempt to say all there is to say about God are always going to be a mixture of right and wrong. They just are. The question we ask not so much is, is it true? What we ask is, is it helpful? Uh, because this is the way theology works. Um, it is like a spotlight. Uh, okay, the, the lights in this theater are, are set up in a certain way, and they can be set up in a lot of different ways. Uh, they're set up in a way now that uh, primarily puts uh, the light on me, and uh, I, I think that's an excellent uh, choice. Um, but you could set this up where, where the, the light would be over here and we wouldn't see those shadows over there and, or the light would be over here and then all this would be in shadows. And that's what theology does. What it does is it shines this light in a certain direction and we see some things that we wouldn't see otherwise. But when we shine the light in that way, what happens is it places other things in shadows. So what I ask my students to do is about any theological system is always ask this question. What does it help you see more clearly than you saw before? And what is it obscuring? And I promise you, all theological systems, if they're any good at all, are doing both. They're helping us see some things more clearly, but the cost of that is they're placing other things in shadows that we don't see so clearly or we obscure. Uh, okay, so the way I told the Heinz dilemma in those two different ways, uh, I shine the light one way and you see some things that are true, but it also obscures some other things, right? I shine the light the other way, you see some things that are true, but it also obscures uh, some other things. Uh, which is to say, we ought to be just a little bit tentative about our theology. Uh, theology never tells the whole truth about God. It can't. Uh, and besides that, it appears like we can only hold a little bit of truth in our minds at one time. And then we kind of got to, you know, gra grab hold of, uh, of some other. Uh, and the first dilemma, I think, shows us that uh, theology is never just about uh, rational processes, uh, just like ethics aren't. Uh, and so you can tell yourself pushing the fat man and, and, and flipping the switch are the same thing, but uh, most people still aren't convinced they're the same thing. You give all the explanations and they're still not convinced they're the same thing. There's, there's something off about it. Uh, and, and the theology that grows out of Scripture uh, actually doesn't just explain or describe, it also evokes. Um, this is my theology class. I say, I say, okay, the goal of this class is uh, not that you will understand theology better. The end of this class, the goal of this class is doxology. That there will be a moment or two in this class where you will say, not, I get it, but that you will say, Praise God. That's what theology that behaves itself the way it should does. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to, I want to take a couple of places where I'm going to try to kind of shine the light in a certain way. And uh, you can take all of this uh, as a warning for the three days. Okay. When I'm shining the light in a certain way, what you already know in the back of your head is, oh, okay, there's some stuff that I'm seeing more clearly than I did, but there's also some stuff that's getting obscure. Okay, that's the closest thing I can come to buyer beware. Um, okay, that's day two of my theology class. Don't catch every disease you read about. <laughs> yeah. um, you, you look at theology as a challenge uh, uh, to your faith, and, and you, uh, you uh, try to think it through. Okay, so um, the, uh, 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 the topic that I'm going to talk about here uh, for a few minutes today, and then we'll take up some other topics tomorrow, 
is uh, the chaos that we experience in the world. Uh, I think that the reason that is most often given to me when students are really struggling with their faith uh, is that uh, the world I witness is not the kind of world that I think a good and loving God would create. Uh, I don't see the evidence of God's movements in the world. Uh, and that uh, it, it doesn't appear to be getting any better. It appears to get worse. Uh, and why would God allow all of this chaos and nonsense and suffering uh, that we have in the world? Um, and I want to take um, basically uh, three passages uh, to, to shine light on this, and uh, you'll be keeping in the back of your mind what is he obscuring. Uh, one Old Testament and two New, uh, because that seems right. <laughs> you, say, you say that stuff on take, you, you don't know if anybody knows this, you're joking or not. Uh, <laughs> I begin with Genesis 1.1. Uh, and I'll give you what I think is the most plausible translation of the passage. Uh, this, this would be sort of a, an Arkansas translation. <laughs> I, I grew up in Arkansas, and this, this is the way I, I think we would translate it correctly. In the beginning... When God was a creating the heavens and the earth, there was chaos. Or in the old translations, the earth was a formless void. Which in the opening passage of Scripture show that the fundamental opponent to God in the world is chaos. I know Satan gets all the lines, but it's chaos that lies beneath Satan. Satan is an agent of chaos. And God comes in into this chaos and he begins a creating and we see order start to emerge. Um, and, and, and we see that through this uh, progression of the creation story, greater and greater evidences of God's creative order. And when it's all done, God says, okay, now that's good. Uh, and I, I, I really like that. I like God standing back and admiring his own work and say, that, that's good. Uh, you know, when I've been able to go to Africa and see animals, I, I, I can just imagine God's delight in some of them. Uh, you know, that, that's really good, you know. <laughs> Giraffes, long necks, no vocal cords. That's good, that's good. <laughs> you know, I like that one. Uh, I guess if you want your giraffes to evolve, they can, but I want mine created by God. Uh, and throughout the, throughout the Bible... Uh, as God moves in, order is what happens. Uh, chaos, uh, suffering, uh, confusion, despair are evidence that the creative work of God has not yet completed its work in that place. Uh, and so uh, the, the, much of the eschatology of the Bible, that is its vision of the last things, is restoring the lost order of creation. Uh, I, I, I think that the, the visions of, of heaven that the Scripture is trying to create is a picture of the world where chaos has been thoroughly and completely defeated. No... 
night. I know some of us like night, but you know, in, in the ancient world, night's a threat. Uh, there's a lot of places in the world where night's uh, still a threat. Uh, you know, no death, no, no sin and disease. These, these agents of chaos have been completely defeated. Okay, so we're, we're, when we're in a world where all of that is going on still, it is evidence, at least, not that God doesn't exist, but at the very least it's evidence that he's not done. And one of my students say, well, it's a chaotic world. And I say, yeah, tell me about it. And, um, well, you know, when you say this doesn't appear to me to be the world of God's dreams, my reaction is, what was your first clue? <laughs> That's exactly right. This is not what God envisions for his good creation. Uh, if you care to look, there are plenty of places where God's creative work has come and bring order, bring order to some of that chaos. But at the moment, we are clearly living in the middle. Between God's working in this chaos and it being defeated. Or to put it the way some theologians put it, we live between the times. Uh, or to put it another way, Christians are the people who know what time it is. Um, okay, and I want to I kind of gesture towards uh, two passages if I have time. One is the book of Colossians, and one is the book of First Peter. Uh, and I, I, I know those sound like long passages, but that's the way this stuff was written. <laughs> you know, when you go in and kind of, uh, kind of yank a verse here and there, you get, you get all sorts of, uh, of uh, chaos. Uh, okay, Colossians first. Uh, okay, this is my confession that I, I feel like for most of my career I've taught Colossians wrong. Uh, and, and in fact, a few weeks ago. <laughs> but after years and years and years, okay, I've changed my mind about, about what Colossians is doing. Okay, you have this church uh, in the Lycus Valley, Colossae. And it is full of people who are fearful. Uh, it is a small church that feels overwhelmed by the forces of the world around it. Can you relate to this? There is a word for these forces that Paul uses multiple times. The word is stoicheia. And you don't have to know what it means to know. That's bad. <laughs> and we don't really know a good way to translate stoicheia. It is the basic principles of this world. But I assure you, it's demonic. Uh, it's, it's, it's those powers that lie beneath all of the evils and the chaos in our world. And some of those we can identify, and some of them we can't. But we know they're out there. There are the stoicheia. And many of us, like, uh, like many of them, are a little bit unnerved by that. Um, uh, A ferry boat ride killing all those kids? Come on. Standing on the edge of World War III because of the disagreements over a patch of ground? Come on. A total inability of government to deal with any of the basic problems Afflict us? Come on. Adolescence? <laughs> um, Stoike. And um, the way I've taught Colossians wrong uh, most of my life is, you know, there, he, he's got, there's this stuff going on there about this, uh, uh, what I thought was an apparent heresy. Uh, okay, so if, if, if you've got a Bible or a phone, turn to Colossians. Uh, 
Uh, chapter 2, we'll start with maybe verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the stoicheia of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every, who is the head over every power and authority. In Him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism and raised with Him through faith in the power of God who raised Him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He's lost connection with the head for whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the stoicheia of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not taste, do not touch, do not handle. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Okay, so I would read this passage, and I say, okay, okay, uh, they, they've got this weird heresy going on in Colossae. And I can see the elements clearly enough. It's got kind of philosophical, uh, new agey elements to it. The worship of angels, deceptive words, probably big words, probably trolleyology. <laughs> it's got Jewish elements to it. You know, um, feast days, rituals. And it's got ascetic, harsh treatment of the body elements to it. Do not taste, do not touch, do not handle. So I think, okay, I got this weird amalgamation heresy going. Uh, the problem is, boy, there just isn't much evidence of any such heresy. Um, and it, would, it does sound like such a weird combination that uh, now I've, I've changed my mind. Uh, I think the issue is their fear of the stoicheia. And what Paul is warning them against are the wrong answers. When you are afraid in the world and you are trying to get control of the world, uh, which, by the way, is uh, magic, which has nothing to do with Christianity. When you try to deal with the chaos of the world on your own terms, what you get is more chaos. So, how are we going to deal with this? Well, we're going to deal with it by, uh, by, by becoming better philosophers, by becoming expert trolleyologists. Or in the Christian system, we're going to become superb theologians. And we are going to so master the faith that we can get control of the stoicheia. But such desire is a will to exercise the power that only God Himself can exercise, and that's not how you get into the garden. That's how you get kicked out of it. And, and, and one of the ways that we try to deal with this is that we say, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to practice religious ritual, but in this case, ritual has become magic. 
And it may be something as, uh, as, as simple as baptism that Paul calls them back to, and he reminds them that baptism is not magic. It, it, it's not like this is the way that you manipulate the universe and get control. Baptism is a giving in to the saving work of God. It's the way that you realize you have no control. And, you know, we, we're prone to... Okay, you know, we got to be honest with our history. Uh, we're the people who were able to get it right, for which the world has been extraordinarily grateful. <laughs> uh, uh, and there may have been, there may have been arrogance there. I, there almost always is. But that wasn't the real issue. The real issue is control. It's always control. And, and, and I'll say, okay, uh, 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 another way I can do it is uh, I can do it through the spiritual disciplines, which I've occasionally talked about. You know, I will, I, will, I will take ascetic practices and I will get my body under control and I will, through sheer willpower and ascetic practices, get control of this chaotic world, at least the little part I'm in. And Paul says, the only thing about that is it doesn't work. He says, those are powers of the stoicheia. Those are the powers of chaos that think that somehow by human willpower and manipulation of our own bodies and desires that we can somehow stand against the chaos of the world. Uh, and what Paul essentially says in Colossians is, that is all nonsense. The defeat of the Stoicheia has already happened in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So before he ever introduces this, um, this problem in Colossians, uh, in the single greatest Christological statement in the Bible... Uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Uh, some people think this is a piece of an old uh, Christian hymn, and uh, if, if it is, uh, you know, kudos to the songwriter. Um, where he says, everything important there is to be said about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Um, he said the stoiche have already been routed. Uh, they've been routed by the work of God in Jesus Christ, who creates and sustains and reconciles. In him the fullness is found. And there is no theology, there are no rituals, there are no spiritual disciplines that can add anything to the work that God has done in Jesus Christ. Now, I shined the light really brightly in one direction. And if you want to, you can say, well, great, I was Tired of going to church anyway. <laughs> now I got a verse for it. Uh, or I never did like those spiritual disciplines. I mean, fasting is very hunger producing. Uh, uh, or uh, eh, it's all a bunch of empty ritual anyway. Uh, but those things have their value. Uh, and I realize, by the way I've shined the light, I've put them in the shadow for the moment. And the reason I've done that is because I think that's what Paul does. 
Now, there are other places where you're going to shine the light in a different direction. But the first thing he wants you to know is this. The only antidote to the chaos in our world is the creative work of God in Jesus Christ. And everything we do as Christians is grounded in that fundamental truth. Uh, oh, I, I, I'm not done, but I am. Fortunately, this is a three-day class. Okay, uh, so I'm going to remember the last sentence that I said. Uh, in fact, I'm going to do like one of my old teachers did. Uh, I'm going to start a sentence, quit in the middle, and then pick it up there tomorrow. Okay. Uh, so there you go. We're going to stop. Right? Okay. <laughs> Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.